Thanks, yeah. How is it? I can't remember that everyone has it's not horrible. seen it. It's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> you can hear it through the door as well. And it's just, oh, it's, it's the worst. But thank you all for watching it and coming. Thank you. There is um, a real kind of history, I think, in the UK with fantastic espionage. You know, you kind of, John Carey is mentioned, Bond, of course. So how does treason fit into that legacy? Well, it is an amazing legacy. And what I wanted to do with this was kind of take the the best things about the British spy genre, but also truthfully stuff I love about the way Americans do these kind of things as well. So I think we do the chess match, the cerebral, the kind of real world stuff really well. But I think the Americans do a bit more of the mess and the beating heart and the emotion. You know, if you think about a Jason Bourne, you know, that the, for me, the reason that movie was so successful are those that, that whole run of movies was you were desperate for this guy to find the truth and you were desperate for him to get justice for this woman that had died that he loved and and that combination of the head and the heart you know the the, the British head and the American heart was kind of what I was trying to do with this that's I think. really interesting mm. and I suppose for Netflix audiences you need to make this as international as possible yeah it's funny I, I mean this sincerely you, do, I, you don't think too much I <laughs> maybe I should but you don't think too much about that and and certainly that was nothing that Netflix ever spoke to me about was like can we make this more international it was you tell a story that you think is gonna move you and hope that maybe other people feel the same yeah where did your research take you because it must have been a lot of fun kind of delving into MI5 MI6 all these kind of old scandals and yeah well I was I've been lucky enough to meet two real spooks you know real spies and it is incredible how ordinary they are it's amazing how you would walk past them on the street mm -hmm. you know so a big part of of me wanting to to put that into the story was they don't walk around in super expensive suits and you know like they they are people that would sit on the tube opposite you and you wouldn't know and so i that and that's really when when we came to looking at charlie what i liked about charlie was he felt super relatable mm. you know and really like a dad and a husband who got a good job and it's like i don't really know what he does what does he do yeah. and you know like well he's a spy yeah and that felt like he was on the continuum of the story we were trying to tell really you know i've heard charlie talk about how much he's enjoyed not just kind of filming back in london but also filming in his own accent yeah <laughs> which is just so you know you must really well there was that. one particular point where we let him go for one weekend he was getting ready to go and do this show called kin where he's irish he was in his normal accent for us, but he had two days in Atlanta on a, on a daredevil cameo in something in the American accent. And he was really sort of scrambled <laughs> trying to find his way through it, but he did it brilliantly. He did it brilliantly. I mean, he does kind of feel, it feels like this role is tailor-made for Charlie. Oh, did brilliant. you write it with him in mind? I didn't. I honestly didn't. I, I very rarely um, have a specific actor in mind. Mm -hmm. I normally have two or three. The only the only thing I ever wrote with anyone in mind was was Bridge of Spies, which was Tom Hanks. Mm -hmm. It was the only thing that I had. I just had him in my mind. But it's more fun sometimes to have. Well, this scene maybe it's going to be Charlie Cox, but in the next scene it's going to be someone else. Mm -hmm. And then what you then do is you allow an actor to push in different directions, so they're not just playing in their safe zone, but they're doing stuff outside of that, you know. And, you know, we kind of mentioned Bond, but um, Ola Kurilenko, yeah. we, you know, we have seen her do incredible things since Bond, but kind of seeing a Bond girl forge her own path in this yeah. was really satisfying. Can, can you tell us how that Yeah, I, I think Olga's brilliant, and I, I've, you look at Olga in Death of Stalin, and then you look at Olga in Quantum of Solace, mm -hmm. that is her range, mm -hmm. that is her, the breadth of her, and so I was really keen to make this a role that could be both things. So she has the physicality, she can do the action really convincingly, but also there is a beating heart to her and a loneliness to her and a drive to her that exists in quiet moments, in moments of just the camera sitting on her and seeing her eyes and feeling a bit of longing. And she's capable of that. So to give her the chance to do that was really exciting, I think. And Una Chaplin as well, just mm. it always feels, she always feels new and exciting even though she's been on our screens for quite a while. Um, so tell us what made her so perfect for Matty. So Una, to me, Una is one of those actors that you, you almost, 
every single day you arrive on set, she is so energized and so alive and so instinctive yeah. that you just, as a writer, you want to give her more. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't even ask for more, but you're like, what, I wonder how she'd react to this or that. She is like an untapped resource, I think. She is like, I, I would write for her forever. Yeah. She's just alive to everything and she burns so brightly in scenes, you know, I love her, she's great. I do feel like she can do anything. Yeah, I think so, I think so. And she wants to as well. Yeah. You know, we had different moments through this. I mean, the, the journey of her character is probably the closest almost to the audience in mm -hmm. some senses, mm -hmm. because you, you have um, someone pulled into something they don't understand that they're trying to work out and they have to get active, they have to do something. And so Una as a, as a person in the middle of the drama is compelling for me as a writer and for the audience. And so I found myself wanting to push moments because I'm like, how would a normal people person react to that? Mm. If someone is forced to pick up a gun, she's been in the army, so she's had that experience, but how does that feel? Because mm. it feels odd and it shouldn't feel normal. Yeah. And it's not easy to to do that. And, and she is a brilliant, personality and energy for reflecting how weird those moments are you know also the whole way through i honestly had no idea whose side we were supposed to be on <laughs> who was the antagonist who was the protagonist it feels like it changes almost minute by minute or at least your kind of idea of it does oh, so tell great. us about how you wanted to play with that well I, I, a lot of that comes really from i think the the necessity of the genre is that it keeps you guessing you know mm. a spy genre should be it should be a bit of a puzzle box but it also should be i think not just about engaging the head but also like how do i feel about this character now i know that how does that change what i've seen before how does it change what's about to happen so i wanted all of the characters to be alive to the shifting sands and truthfully for no one to be perfect for no one to be you know unimpeachable for everyone to have a little flaw a little problem a little thing that the audience was like i don't know how i feel about that yeah. now but i'm gonna stick with it because i'm compelled and work it through you know the one thing whenever i kind of start watching a, something to do with espionage is the tech i'm always really interested in that because it must be really enjoyable to write whether it's new tech, whether it's kind of learning about developing tech in that world. So what was your kind of angle on that and how far did you want to go with it? Yeah, not, I'll be really honest, not very far because I wanted, to, I wanted it to be, when I, when I spoke to people that worked in the service, they used things that were useful to them, mm. but it was about data collection and it was about um, making sure they were safe. Mm -hmm. And so that there wasn't anything particularly whizzy, there wasn't anything that could go wrong in the field, it was all very basic stuff. For example, the pen. Yeah. So the pen. <laughs> we love this pen. The, the, the pen is real and the pen is a really? it, yeah, absolutely. And it's a really, really simple thing. And but it, it helps somebody in the field to get the information they need and then get out. And that was what I was interested in, just the the the, the everyday spyware rather than mm. satellites and you know whizzy yeah. laptops and that stuff yeah very practical yeah she wouldn't like it <laughs> um <laughs> can you tell us a bit about your company binocular production yeah and, and why you wanted this particular project to be the first out of binocular yeah i so i started as a playwright mm -hmm. and, and I, I didn't have you know any i didn't study writing so i i, I started as a playwright and and had productions in in London and at, at the National Theatre and I had an experience which was amazing of being mentored by people and being being taught how to write getting better at my craft because people put their arm around me and said okay look at this read this watch this and I, I, I found truthfully the more mentoring I did as I went further in my career the more it felt like you were paying that back. Mm. And so as a company, what I wanted to do was formalize that. So what, what we've done is we've got, there's six of us at the company, we work with emerging writers to really put some structure around them, you know, put, put some sort of um, mentoring in place. So they've got a great seed of an idea, but they've, they've maybe a great playwright, but they've never written any TV before. So we can help them. Okay, here's how TV needs to move. Here's how it needs to feel. So that's a big part of it for me, but then also truthfully putting that structure in place 
has made me able to pursue things that I want to do. So, you know, show running and, and putting this together was was so exhilarating for me. I've had an experience last year of, of directing a movie with um first movie I've directed with Halle Berry in it, Incredible. which which we're in post production on at the moment. And that thank you, yeah. And and that that came out of suddenly having a structure and an ability to say like I want to tell this story and I really feel like I could be the one to tell it, you know. So I think the company is empowering me and other writers, I guess. That's amazing. And you work with two directors on this, which yeah. I always find really interesting, the kind of the split mm. of how does that work cohesively to create the same vision when you're working with multiple directors? So how did you help to oversee that? Yeah, that, it's a big part of show running is that cohesion, to yeah. be honest, because you've got you've got two blocks in a show like this. So you've got, you know, someone directing the first block, the first few episodes, and someone coming in and directing the, the, the second block, the last two episodes, say. And um, you have to be that that sort of that set of eyes to make sure across it that truthfully things it looks like the same show it moves like the same show mm -hmm. and that can be quite technical which is you know someone hasn't used steadicam at all in the first couple of episodes and then all this person wants to do is use steadicam right. and you're like we've got to we can't that's going to look different yeah but another part of it truthfully is is palette you know is is working the reason that was so exciting to work with Louise Hooper and Sarah O'Gorman on this was they'd never done the genre before. So it wasn't going to look or feel like someone who'd done a million spy shows. Yeah. And that was really exciting. So we talked a lot about warmth. We talked a lot about the fact that you know, a lot of spy shows are greys and blues and glass, mm -hmm. which is great and looks really cool, mm -hmm. but it's quite chilly yeah. and it keeps you out sometimes. And this was always a, a kind of a domestic drama wrapped in a spy show. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted I wanted the home to feel warm. I wanted that that love between this family to feel real. And and so working on that that color palette. So you did have those blues and grays, but when you got home, it felt warm through the whole series, through tiny things of what people wear. You know, like that's what gives you a a cohesion. I think. Mm. Um, have we got any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, show takes place during a leadership election. <laughs> How have you felt these last couple of weeks watching this news, knowing that, you've, that this is going to be a key part of your story? It's really, it's horrible, I'll be honest with you, because you, you just feel like you're behind, and then you feel like, oh, maybe we're in front a bit. The only, the only plus of it is people understand the rules of a leadership election now, because <laughs> yeah. we've just been through it. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, we have a foreign secretary running for leader, obviously. We were in post-production when, when Liz Truss, you know, threw her hat in the ring. You've got to be alive to if you're if you're if you're writing a show that's hopefully having a bit of a dialogue with the real world, it's probably inevitable that this stuff happens. You know what's tougher, truthfully, is you know we we had a, a cast member who's Ukrainian, Olga is Ukrainian, and uh, a cast member who's Russian, which is um, was really tough, and that was tough because we were. Every day they were coming to work, and they were coming to work with the real world on their phones, and people that they, they you know, people they'd lost, friends and family that they couldn't connect with, and being there for them in a sort of pastoral care way while the real world mm -hmm. was coming. That was so. So you you sort of have a you have kind of a a practical challenge of the real world catching up with you, and then this kind of emotional challenge as well, I guess. Thank you. Um, sorry, that gentleman's doing sound over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, you, you talked about working with new writers for your company. Mm -hmm. Is this a completely authored series? I know you're showrunning, but you, have you brought in established or emerging writers? This and, and were it to return, is that something you feel perhaps you could work with? Yeah. Yeah. No, I have. So there's another writer that I work with on this called Amanda Duke, who very excitingly got. Um, on the broadcast hot shot list last week and is a writer that I um, had read a couple of early scripts of and I think hadn't had anything on TV at that point and I just really really connected with her I liked her a lot I liked the way she approached story she came from casting um, you know had a couple of kids and was looking to change and write some stories and I, I loved the way she came into business so she worked on um, Episode two, episode three, we wrote together. 
Yeah, so she wrote two on her own and three and four we wrote together. And I'd work with, I'm working with her on something else at the moment, I'd work in a heartbeat with her again. On a second season, if we're lucky enough, the plan is to open the room up even more, to be honest, and to get, for me to show run, um, a few more voices in that room, because I love that, that, I love supporting emerging voices, and I think Netflix are, they're very committed to that as well, especially in terms of diversity and getting some, some talent into our business that needs support at an earlier stage, you know? Could you be involved with other directors and things? Oh, wow. Do you know what? I don't know. In, in a strange way, I don't know. With a producer hat on, I don't know if that would be smart. I think I think the, the responsibility of a showrunner, when it's done well, unless it's a totally altered piece, I think the best way for a showrunner to conduct themselves is to be either all about the story or really into the visuals. You know, So I would want a director that was... I'd want to hire someone that was prodding and poking the story a bit and making me better at what I'm doing, I think. Thank you, a couple more. Just to pick up on the, um, the earlier answer you gave about the Ukrainian and Russian actors, mm. uh, it's probably a naive question to ask, but did you worry there might be some conflict between the two of them, bearing in mind their countries are... are yeah, no, it's, a, it's not a naive question at all. They worked a lot together uh, back in Russia. They'd done a lot of movies together and had a wonderful relationship and actually managed to help them help each other through through the experience of it um so no i wasn't worried about that i was worried about them as human beings being so far away from home you know um but they 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 the crew was great they were there for each other and yeah you just but every day brought something pretty tough for them to deal with i think and the other question was there's a scene earlier in, in the piece where a disabled man is having physiotherapy um was that a, and he's a serviceman, ex serviceman. Mm. Was he a real life ex serviceman? He was a real serviceman, yeah. He's, we're going to see him at the Carson Crew screening in a few days' time. It's my, my, my brother is an amputee, and it, for me, it's really important that you know, <coughs> you, you, I wrote that part deliberately because I know, I know there are a lot of, of um, ex servicemen amputees out there who are looking to make a change in their lives, and it felt like a really the right thing to go and find someone who was actually a serviceman and had had that experience, you know. Thank, Thank you. you. Gentleman again. Um, was the heartbeat technology access real? No, that wasn't made up. <laughs> <laughs> follow up. I was, was going to say, just follow that, because you talked to us now, you used the phrase beating heart three times and heartbeat four times. Um, you can tell a guy whose last major role at Netflix was as a person who could read people by their heartbeats and identify them. Is this something that you're doing with this? Is this something like this show? Is something about you, you identify people by their heart? Is this a metaphor that you're writing here, or is this completely really good friends? Wow, I'm, I'm kind of what I kind of want to say it is because it's smart. Um, no, truthfully, when we were coming, to, when when the when the score was being put together, we talked a lot about heartbeats. It's got a lot of heartbeats used in the score through the show as well, in terms of 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 tempo and drive. It's not a coincidence that the show to me ends up becoming more about about the heart of a person and the choices a person makes for themselves and their family more than their head and their country i guess so i think probably the the motif of the heartbeat is 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 more about yeah driving driving choices from you as a human being i guess yeah thank you did you get yes last question thank you well done it was really excellent oh thank you i'm sure everyone enjoyed it um were there any real traitorous spies in, in the British Secret Service that you particularly were thinking about when you wrote this? No, there wasn't actually. I mean, partly because the really famous ones, the you know Philbys, and and they've been they've been so mined. Uh, and I, I think that the smaller actors in in acts of treason or whatever are are less easy to identify. I wanted to I wanted to make it feel um, real that we could understand why someone might do something. We could understand why someone might be forced to do act in a way that was not, um, was contrary to everything they'd believed in and found themselves in a corner that would ask us the same question of, well, what would I do? Would I do that? Would I, how would I react to that? But that was a fictional kind of motor for the story rather than a, a, a case file or something that I found, you know? Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much oh, to Matt right. Shulman. That Pleasure. was really Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you.